to uh, welcome you to uh, the last session today, uh, Engineering the Tools of uh, Future Engineering and Discoveries. We're very honored this afternoon to have as our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Griffin. Uh, Dr. Griffin is the King MacDonald Eminent Scholar and Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and Director of the Center for System Studies at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and he's also a former NASA Administrator. Uh, I'd like to invite Mike to the podium, and it's all yours. Thanks. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, in the spirit of the theme of the conference, of course, I'm going to talk about engineering the tools of discovery, but I'm going to take what I hope you will think is a little bit different slant on the subject. Um, I'm going to talk about engineering tools of discovery in the sense that I regard system engineering as a tool. Despite our progress in developing the art and science of uh, what I call system engineering, uh, there are a lot of unresolved issues. And so I'll go back several decades and I'll give you some examples of things that I've personally been involved in where, and, I, and I'm particularly attracted to examples of a special type. And the special type is examples of large, complicated systems where everybody does everything right and it still doesn't work at the end. Okay, and, I, and it's easy to find, uh, and, and if one is in the finger pointing mode, and I, I never like to do that, it's easy to find examples of large systems or even small systems which fail because someone does something wrong. Okay, got that. How about where everybody meets whatever obligation it was required of them to meet and the end result doesn't work? That should give us pause. And we can find it in things like Three Mile Island, we can find it in shuttle accidents, um, but we can find it in smaller systems even, even so. For example, I had the uh, privilege of working for several years on Hubble Space Telescope back in the early days. And um, we reached a point, it was possible by the time I came onto the program in the early 1980s for um, the prime contractor for the telescope, the optical telescope assembly, and the spacecraft bus, and that was then Lockheed, not Lockheed Martin, because Martin was a separate company back then for all you young folks. It was possible for Lockheed to prove that they had met their interface control requirements. It was possible for the optical systems contractor, Perkin Elmer, to prove that they had met all of their interface control requirements. It was also possible to demonstrate with uh, simulation and later on experiment and then later on in-flight history that although both uh, associate contractors could meet their interface control requirements, in the end the device did not work. Um, leaving aside, again, the issue of the mirror. Now, it didn't work for a number of fundamental reasons, one of which is that at some point somewhere along the line, a uh, uh, an astronomer counted photons wrong. Uh, it didn't work because structural engineers didn't talk to control system engineers and didn't realize that solar arrays would uh, uh, waggle back and forth when they went into and out of shadow. It didn't work because people who had only worked on rockets uh, didn't understand that a telescope in low Earth orbit uh, using NMOS circuitry, popular at the time, would have a total radiation dose allowance of about 700 rads, which would be exceeded within a few weeks. It didn't work for a host of other reasons. But everybody met their interface control requirements, and yet the device didn't function. I'll fast forward 30 years. I had the, uh, from a technical point of view, great enjoyment while I was NASA administrator of sitting in a, a series of reviews focused around the uh, fact that we had a, an Atlas V rocket on the pad with a spacecraft bound for Pluto on the top. The spacecraft was the New Horizons spacecraft. It carried a radioisotope thermoelectric generator on it with all of the public uh, relations concern that such a payload entails. And it was possible uh, to demonstrate that this was a rocket whose design failed its qualification test. 
and yet it had passed in, in a matter of engineering design and development every single test put forward to get it to qual test. The issue became, uh, I, I managed, only because I was the boss, <laughs> to get the issue focused on not whether or not the upper stage had failed its qualification test, that was plain for everyone to see, but would this rocket with these flight loads and this payload on this particular trajectory break on this occasion? And the answer to that question was no. And so we were able ultimately to launch. Um, but it was another case where you could not find a flaw in anything that had been done all along the way to produce a rocket on the pad, except that finally some smart person noticed that it wasn't, that the design was actually not, not going to work. These kinds of examples intrigue me, much more so than when somebody just plain makes a simple mistake. Because what I find when we go through the failure uh, review on anything from Columbia or Challenger down to uh, why an individual box broke in Thermovac, um, what I find is that the answer that comes out of such reviews always seems to be that somehow or other we need more process, that we haven't had enough process control. Um, when we didn't have system engineering process, and I'm old enough to remember when we didn't, okay, and when it had to be invented, that was a, a, that was a correct assessment. We did need more process. Today, I don't think it is. I'm reminded of the definition, the classic definition of insanity is continuing to do the same things over and over and expecting a different outcome. In fact, I think we're now in the position with our system engineering processes of we're doing things right, but we're not doing the right things. Now, um, so I think, and I am saying here for, for you and other places for others, that I think what's needed is a different view of system engineering. We need to look at it from a different angle. We need to pick a different coordinate direction and see how the projection onto n minus one space looks from that different axis. My friend and former NASA administrator, several administrators before me, Bob Frosch, in a 1969 paper to the IEEE, Bob gave a, what I regard as a seminal speech that I've probably distributed to a couple of thousand people uh, to an IEEE conference. And Bob pointed out that in, this was in 1969, that system engineering process had run amok. That, uh, in, in his words, uh, which I will, will use, uh, not literally, but, but in spirit, Bob pointed out that um, many people approach system engineering in the way of uh, computer-generated music. They understood all the rules by which a symphony would be put together, but they had no ear for the craft. And he asked the question, rhetorical of course, you know, what do we think about computer-generated symphonies versus one that's been written by Bach or Brahms? And the answer is we can tell the difference. We may not, as human beings, know how we can tell, but we can tell. Um, not everything worth doing can be reduced to a flowchart of process. And not everything which can be put on a process flowchart is worth doing. My uh, uh, only a few years older, longtime good friend, Gentry Lee at JPL, one of the best systems engineers I've known, says that system engineering is about the partials between uh, related subsystems. And I like that expression as much as anything I've heard. Uh, since Gentry invented it, um, I can't use it. Uh, so what I always say is that system engineering is about, uh, it's about the interaction and, and not the interactee. Um, it's about the context of the engineering problem and not the details of the structure. It's about the verbs and not the nouns. If the nouns are strength of materials and guidance and navigation and attitude control and, and uh, power and thermal control and all of that, then system engineering is about how we make sure all of those relate well and relate properly. It's about more than that. In Frosch's paper, he talks about the concept of design elegance um, with, 
which I find myself strongly in sympathy. We all know an elegant design when we see one. We don't know what its properties are. I've lately taken to trying to quantify that because I think that's where we need to go. When we want to talk about system engineering, we need to talk more about elegance and less about process. So what do I mean when I talk about design elegance? We see it when we look at a P-51 Mustang, for those of us who are in the room who are aerospace engineers. Um, we don't see it in some other less favored aeronautical creations. I won't be unkind by commenting. Um, we know it when we see it. So what is it, what is it, how do we, we can't, if we're going to study design elegance, we need to talk about what the properties of that might be. Well, let me submit that a few of the properties that, that I've been able to tease out are along the following lines. First of all, does the design actually work? And, and of, of course, I mean, yes, it will perform the intended function. But does it perform it um, in a way that, that is clear and simple and straightforward? Or is it uh, not for nothing do we have the expression a Rube, Rube Goldberg device. For those of us who are old enough to remember the Boy Scouts and Boy's Life, uh, there, there used to be Rube Goldberg inventions. Um, if it works, if it works, and if it clearly works, is it robust? We have many, many examples, especially in aerospace, of devices that uh, work well as long as everything is just right. But a slight departure from the environmental conditions under which the device was expected to work, or a slight departure from the parameters uh, and requirements to which the device is built, and it doesn't work anymore. Hubble was a good example of that. There are others. So is it robust? I would submit that a property of an elegant design is that it's robust. Is it efficient? If it, if it works and is reasonably robust, does it produce a good ratio of output to input? Input being the resources necessary to, uh, to put the device in the field. Okay, um, is it like the old joke about uh, like mating of elephants accompanied with a lot of roaring and screaming and you don't get a result for 18 months. That's not an efficient design. It may work. And finally, and very crucially, with regard to system engineering, do we understand the unintended consequences of the design? Do we understand all of the things that it does that we didn't want it to do? I'm fond in my system engineering courses of teaching students or attempting to teach students, I don't know if I succeed or not, that most things which get past preliminary design review will actually do what the designer says they will do. And that the difference between a good design and a bad design is all of the things that a bad design does that nobody wants. Um, that's where my friend Gentry, Gentry Lee, when he talks about the, uh, uh, that system engineering is about understanding the partials, he's dead on track. Because we really want the partials between systems that are not intended to interact to be very small. Um, the first person I believe to explore this, uh, this concept of unintended consequences, and I may be wrong, but the first one I know to explore it was actually a sociologist, Charles Perrow who wrote a book called Normal Accidents. And if you haven't read it, I would recommend that you do so. Uh, Pero points out that our desire for uh, maximal efficiency creates uh, systems which are tightly coupled and very complex, uh, yielding interactions between and among subsystems that are not only not understandable, they are in fact impossible to understand because there are too many of them, and that the accidents which result from such systems he terms normal accidents because they should be expected. It's a very intriguing concept. Now, I think we need to make system engineering itself a research topic. We haven't really done that. You can be a civil engineer and be engaged in research, and yet, and, and today, because of that fact, uh, we no longer judge the quality of a building by whether or not it falls down as we did with cathedrals 
seven or 800 years ago, we can design structures today that are optimal and for which you can prove to a questioner are optimal given the constraints that have been imposed on the structure. We don't have the foggiest notion yet of what constitutes optimal system engineering. In fact, I'm not sure I've heard anyone else ask the question. We don't even know if system engineers can be taught or if they have to be identified. We don't know if it's a personality type or if it's trainable or like most things to, to, to what extent each of those two components holds sway. Moreover, uh, with all due respect to my academic colleagues because I now are one, uh, system engineering, if it can be taught, in my opinion, cannot be taught by people whose uh, primary uh, course of life, whose primary career has been in academia. It is, in my view, a discipline which is inherently tied to the practice of actual engineering. But the practice of actual engineering, any history of the practice of actual engineering by those seeking to be academics is regarded as a negative in terms of appointing that person to uh, a tenure track position. Academic disciplines are siloed, stovepiped, whatever you would want to call them. Interdisciplinary actions among academics are a sure path to denial of tenure. In engineering practice, if I refrain now or step aside from picking on my academic colleagues in the field of engineering practice, the focus on requirements uh, in my view, is a death knell for proper system engineering. I can prove to you, statistically, that if you specify a system, what a system should do in terms of rigid requirements, you will produce a less optimal system than would otherwise be the case. And yet, because the development of large, complex systems is almost inevitably tied to uh, the expenditure of taxpayer dollars, and the oversight of those taxpayer dollars by our elected and appointed representatives. Requirements, uh, tracking and requirements focus is all we have to be able to demonstrate that proper stewardship of taxpayer funds has been accomplished. So the very task we set about, that of ensuring that we have been good stewards of taxpayer money, interferes with being good stewards of taxpayer money. We need to move beyond that. We need to move beyond requirements. Uh, when I was a small boy in Georgia, I once heard a, uh, a banker who was a friend of the family comment that, uh, son, sometimes you have to rise above principle. <laughs> I have remembered that for 55 plus years. I regard it as, uh, as a comment that has so much truth in it that, that uh, we should all know that comment. Sometimes in developing requirements for engineering systems, we have to rise above requirements, and we haven't learned how to do it. We haven't learned how to incorporate what we now know about decision theory into um, the making of engineering decisions. Using Arrow's theorem, I can prove to you that if there are three or more alternatives in a choice facing us, that, pair, that the, uh, the only... Uh, that pairwise comparison of the various choices available will produce pathological outcomes. The classic example of that was the Clinton, Perot, Bush 1 election in, in 92, which has been amply studied by uh, decision theorists, but it's only one of, of many. Anytime three or more choices are available, the only efficient, the only non-pathological resolution, and again, this can be proven mathematically, is a, is a benign dictatorship. So we need to study decision theory and decision making in the development of engineering systems, and nowhere that I know of is that incorporated into our knowledge of, of what we want in a system engineering curriculum. If we believe that system engineering itself is a tool uh, for the future of scientific discovery, and particularly in space, if we believe that, and I do, then to engineer the tools of discovery means we, that we need to focus on the system engineering process itself. We need to look at it with a new eye. We need to look at it from a different place in coordinate space and see what it looks like from that new place. Uh, we are, in my opinion, not going to get there by uh, pursuing yet another failure review 
the next time some large complex system like an oil well in the Gulf fails, and trying to find out who did what wrong so that, first of all, the guilty party can be punished, and second of all, uh, we can add more process requirements so that that mistake doesn't happen again. Okay, that is not the path to the future success of system engineering for the kinds of things we want to build as we uh, uh, move off the Earth and into space. So thanks for listening to me. I, I hope I've provoked at least one or two new thoughts, and if all of you have already had all these thoughts before, then I apologize for wasting your time. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Mike uh, has certainly worked with very large uh, systems. As we talk about aerospace and large uh, systems for uh, engineering scientific discovery, uh, we've all seen failures and successes. And the more we can understand what will lead to successes, the better. And within that large framework of systems, there are components. Uh, you know, what we're talking about propulsion or uh, and, and power, or we're talking about electrical, or we're talking about data. We need to understand what those challenges are for the future. And so it's with that that I'm uh, very uh, pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ed Crawley, who's the Ford Professor of Engineering and Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics and of Engineering Systems at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, Dr. Crawley and I had the, the good fortune to work a couple years ago on a National Academy study that looked at uh, the systems required for exploration. And so, Ed. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, I thought I would um, sort of connect uh, one of the major projects I've been working on uh, recently with the, uh, the question that Bonnie asked us to address today and talk about the engineering tools of discovery as viewed from the perspective of the recently or last fall concluded Human Space Flight Plans Committee, uh, better known as the Augustine Committee. Um, and the, the end of this is sort of the list of uh, technologies which one would think would uh, support uh, exploration and particularly human exploration. Uh, but I think it's important to sort of lay the context uh, that we, that, of how we got to these, uh, these conclusions uh, and, and hopefully, Mike, along the way, we'll do some good system engineering. So the, um, the first place we started really was in a, a, a good in-depth discussion of why we explore and why, why we explore space, and in particular, why we explore space with humans. Now, nothing on this is particularly new or revolutionary. It's just a statement of the, the well-understood reasons why the nation invests in a human spaceflight program that we uh, explore in order to gain ability to explore some more. That there are credible, although not, uh, one should not take advantage of the benefits uh, that derive from science in the justification of human spaceflight. That there is, of course, technology that's produced for human spaceflight, for other users of space, uh, and for uh, life on Earth. And of course, there's economic uh, development and industrial capability that's maintained. And then there are these less tangible benefits, which, especially in Washington, are very important. Uh, the, the leadership, the perceived role that uh, spaceflight gives uh, to uh, the nation uh, in an era of soft power, uh, of way of engaging uh, in, in a constructive and forward-looking activity, our international partners, uh, the engagement of the public, um, and particularly, uh, many of you are here today, the stimulation of the youth to study things that are broadly viewed as being desirable to have young people uh, study. Uh, I once uh, had the privilege of giving some uh, uh, testimony and advice to uh, the House of Lords in, in London. And one member of Lords asked me, Ed, why do you think it is that um, uh, students in America tend to want to study science and mathematics more than they do in Great Britain. And I looked at them and I said, it's because we have a human spaceflight program. Uh, this, uh, this connection, this excitement that can be generated is really very important. But it was an interesting thing that amongst this group of the Augustine Committee, which included generals and leaders of defense space and CEOs of business and a few scientists and so forth, that we very rapidly evolved the idea that uh, 
the, the uh, eventual goal of uh, human spaceflight for the United States and for our international partners should be to move towards exploring Mars. And we decided to, to use this phrase that the exploration of Mars is the ultimate destination for human spaceflight exploration of the inner solar system. Someday we may go beyond the inner solar system. Uh, and that an important part of the exploration of Mars is not just to visit it, but to actually move towards having extended stays there with the eventual goal of creating at least the capability for a permanent human presence. So we actually took these uh, goals and laid them out, as you can see in this chart behind me, in terms of the, the beneficial attributes, uh, not requirements, uh, that a desirable human spaceflight program would have. And you can see exploration, preparation, technology, innovation, the things I've just mentioned. Uh, and the columns in the middle are, are an interesting exercise. We went back and connected these goals of the human spaceflight program to previous statements. Uh, and in order here, uh, from left to right, they're the Space Act of 1958, the, the, uh, the constitution, if you will, of NASA, the enabling legislation. The vision for space exploration uh, created by President Bush in 2004. Uh, the Global Exploration Strategy, an international working group document in 2007. And the OSTP, that is to say, Obama administration guidance uh, last summer. And the message here is, 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 is pretty striking that there is a, a, a broad and consistent consensus about why it is that we have a human spaceflight program and what it should achieve. Uh, there are also some evaluation measures which are more the uh, system engineering uh, type things, uh, affordability, uh, risk profile, uh, timeliness, and so forth. So we actually tried to use these long-held and, and commonly understood uh, goals of the human exploration program in order to uh, help identify options and evaluate them. So the... Um, Decision makers do, in fact, as Mike said, uh, make decisions. And we tried to explicitly describe uh, the options. We were asked, by the way, not to make recommendations, but to define options and evaluate them. We tried to uh, explain the options that were in front of the administration in terms of a set of five decisions, which are listed here. Uh, the first two uh, are, uh, what should we do with the shuttle? Should we retire it as had been the plan uh, in, the next, in the course of the next year without getting into details of which fiscal year it's in? Uh, and should we extend the ISS, the International Space Station, beyond 2015 uh, and uh, strengthen it as an institution of uh, research in space? Some of you may know it's now actually considered under legislation to be one of our national laboratories. And the, the two recommendations, or I'm sorry, the two um, the sets of options here that were eventually chosen by the administration were essentially the de facto policy to allow the shuttle to retire and, in fact, to extend the space station uh, well beyond 2015, in fact, to 2020. There are two uh, issues that, that I won't go into a lot of detail here about um, the launch systems that should be developed, both for heavy lift and for cargo. And I'm going to actually spend uh, most of the rest of my time talking about the last question, which is a strategy for exploration. This, um, this chart sort of summarizes the, the, the thinking that we went through in the course of the Augustine panel about a strategy for exploration. And you, you start up in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, at the beginning of the summer, uh, we, we ran from approximately June to October of last year, 2009. At the beginning of the summer, uh, we had all of these questions ahead of us. Uh, what should we do with the ISS? Uh, uh, should we go to the moon? Uh, should we go on something which we'll call the flexible path, which I'll describe in a minute? Or should we try and go directly to Mars? Um, surprisingly to me and to many people on the committee, the first of these decisions that we grappled with and, and tried to resolve was what should we do with the ISS? Um, the, uh, the, the explicit plan, although many will argue, and probably correctly, that the, the implicit plan was actually different, 
The explicit plan was to retire the International Space Station in 2015, only about five years after it was really completed. Many of the international modules, or most of the international modules, only actually appeared on orbit uh, in 2008 and 2009. Uh, what, what we uh, were able to uh, argue is that it was in the interest of uh, both of the US use of the space station uh, and the international participation of the station to extend this uh, well into the future, and the current phrase is uh, beyond 2020. And to actually invest more in the, in the ex, uh, use of the space station by uh, developing sufficient research uh, facilities to really exploit it, and it's now about six-person crew that are on orbit. So we, we actually, in some senses, took the, uh, the International Space Station and said, it's not a problem, it's really part of the solution. That we should use it uh, as it was always intended, and as many think it, it would always have been used, that we should use it uh, in order to understand more about uh, human reaction, physiology, adaptation uh, in space within the, the confines that it exists in low Earth orbit, that we should use it to study space operations so that we're better prepared to operate beyond low Earth orbit when we leave low Earth orbit in, let's say, the 20s, uh, uh, and so forth. So that, so we've, we've now sort of put the, the ISS on the critical path, if you will. Now, uh, for those of you keeping track of, of budget numbers, that does not come at low cost, because that means that the NASA budget sustains the operation of the ISS for at least five more years uh, out of an assumingly approximately zero-sum uh, game uh, budget. So then we looked at the moon, the flexible path, and Mars. And in particular, uh, the next one we tackled was Mars. Do we have the capability to do what many scientists would argue is the most valuable thing that human explorers could do in the inner solar system and go and walk on the surface of Mars and explore, uh, as we did to, on the moon? And uh, essentially, we came to the conclusion that that's not feasible now. There's too many things we don't know particularly about the human reaction to such a trip, physiological and psychological reaction to such a trip. And that with the technology we have, at the state of readiness we have it, it would become uh, uh, unsustainable within any reasonable expo uh, expectation of the NASA budget. So this takes Mars and moves it from being a, an option for an immediate destination for humans out towards, as I said earlier, sort of the ultimate destination, the place that we don't want to go to, but the place that we want to go towards. And then it frames the rest of the discussion as how would you prepare to go towards Mars? So that leaves the diagram in the lower right-hand corner, uh, where the two options are uh, to go first to the moon, or to do something which we call the flexible path, which is to not go to the surface of any large bodies, that is to say specifically to the moon or Mars as the first destination, but to, live, uh, to learn to live and work in deep space, uh, visiting progressively more and more energetically and time-wise challenging places to go and visit, to learn how to work in, in deep space, uh, and to learn how to encounter smaller bodies, such as uh, spent, asteroid, uh, spent comets and asteroids that are near-Earth object crossing obj uh, objects. So that gets us down to the lower left-hand corner and asks, uh, should we go first to the moon, or should we go first and work at, to, learn, to, uh, to learn how to work in deep space? Well, think about the following. If we went first to the moon and de developed an understanding of how to land and operate in a sustainable way on another planetary body, and we did that for 10 or 15 or 20 years, but no American, no astronaut had ever been more than three and a half days away from Earth, uh, would the one of you who will be the NASA administrator at that time really, with a straight face, be able to say, Mr. President, now we've understood how to go to the moon. 
we're ready to take the 900-day mission to Mars. And I would say that's unlikely, that there's some set of intermediate activities, the Gemini to Apollo metaphor, that you would need to do in order to actually build up and feel comfortable about sending humans so far away for so long. Likewise, if what you did for the decade of the 20s was to go to asteroids and go to Martian orbit and such things, and you had never been to the surface of a planetary body since the Apollo landings of the late 60s and early 70s, would you feel ready to land on the surface of Mars? And I think that's equally unlikely. So I would argue that before we land on the surface of Mars, which we've now sort of set as the goal, the long-term goal, that we'll do both operating in deep space and visiting the nearest planetary surface, the moon. And it really just comes down to an issue of which order that we do them in. Do we do them deep space and then the moon, or do we do the moon and then deep space? And I'll come back to that sequencing question a little later. So another way to think about this is think about where the destinations are in terms of the engineering difficulty of getting the and assuming you've gotten to low Earth orbit, which is sort of the staging point for anything beyond low Earth orbit, um, across the bottom of this scale is the approximate uh, measure of delta V, a, a measure of the energy required uh, in order to get to these different destinations. Uh, it takes uh, about uh, three and a half or four kilometers a second to get out of low Earth orbit and go essentially anywhere to, in, the, in the range of uh, escape. So you see that there is actually a set of destinations, all of which are energetically less challenging than going to the surface of the moon. Because of course, to go to the moon, you have to leave Earth and go down into the gravity well, and then come up out of the gravity well and go back, to Earth, back towards Earth. So the moon is actually an energetically more challenging place to go than a variety of other places, which I'll discuss in a second. You can see them. But they, they include uh, a Mars flyby. It's actually. Uh, it's possible to spend less energy but much more time uh, getting to doing a flyby of Mars than it is to go to the surface of the moon. Then there's the lunar surface, and then basically there's the very energetic missions to the Martian surface. And that's as hard as it gets because there's, there's no body in the inner solar system uh, that you would ever land on that has a gravity well deeper than Mars. So if you can, basically if you can go to Mars, you can go almost any place. And the, the vertical axis here is a notional scale of basically increasing mass uh, and increasing mission duration, although uh, it, it has to be taken as notional to, to make the same axis work for both scales. So what is this, uh, this new strategy? Um, it's the idea that humans would travel, would learn to travel in space. This is the flexible path idea. That humans would learn to travel in space and that they would go to locations like low Earth orbit, right? One doesn't visit anything when one goes to low Earth orbit other than the space station. Uh, they would go to locations like the Lagrange points in the Earth-Moon system, the Lagrange points in the Earth-Sun system, which have unique characteristics which might cause us to want to one day exploit resources there. That one would go to the vicinity of larger bodies, the Moon and Mars, and interact with them through a combination, through robotic exploration, go into standard orbit and send down a class one probe, uh, and to go to the smaller bodies, the near Earth objects, the Earth crossing objects, or the uh, moons of Mars, and, and, and visit them and uh, return samples. So this isn't just a different destination. This is the idea that the way that humans will explore in space first is to go to the vicinity of things and go to locations and use robotic interactions to get to the surface, as opposed to going and descending with, with and they have the humans descend to the surface. Now, it turns out that if you catalog the uh, more than 10,000, uh, many more than 10,000 known objects in the solar system inside the orbit of Jupiter, there are only something between about two and six of them that you would ever land on. One of them happens to be our nearest object, the moon. Another is Mars. 
uh, it's possible that you could actually land on barely land, that is to say, stick to the surface of a few of the largest asteroids. And it's possible that you could land on a few of the, uh, the Galilean moons of Jupiter if you could withstand the radiation environment that close to Jupiter. And all of the other places in the inner solar system you would encounter. If you got near an asteroid, it, it has uh, microgravity. It has one to several hundred microgravity. So that you sort of drift up to it just like you get into proximity and operate near the space station. You don't actually land on an asteroid, which of course makes it in some senses easier. So here is a list of the types of places that you might go, and let me just read them down. The first few are essentially test flights. They're to, to test the systems that will take humans away from low Earth orbit for the first time since 1972. It's been a long time uh, since humans left low Earth orbit. As President Bush said in the speech that announced the vision for space exploration, uh, since 1972, no human has been more than about 380 or so miles from the planet surface, roughly the distance from Washington, D.C. to Boston. Right. So we're in space, but we're in pretty near space. So the first few flights would be to places uh, like uh, low Earth orbit, I'm sorry, uh, geosynchronous orbit, Mars orbit, uh, uh, I'm sorry, lunar orbit, or to the uh, Earth, Sun, Earth, Moon, Lagrange points. These are, I think, you think of as test, test flights. Then you can go to uh, the Earth, Sun, Lagrange points, important because these will be the sites of future uh, astronomical observatories. So the future metaphor of astronauts servicing the Hubble is actually astronauts going to the Earth, Sun, L2 point to, sub, to, to uh, service things like the James Webb Space Telescope and to visit the, the near-Earth objects. And then the final phase is to go towards Mars. Uh, and there are some interesting trajectories which actually take you to the vicinity of Mars and allow you to loiter there for weeks and months and come back on what is essentially a free return trajectory but uh, which exploits uh, gravity uh, assist off of Mars, both an entry and, a, and an arrival. Oh, the, the thing that makes this chart make sense, by the way, is what I'm going to leave to, to Dr. Dunbar to discuss, which is that we don't really, the, the real unknown here is how are the humans going to adapt to this and how are they going to tolerate the, the long-term weightlessness the long-term deep space radiation environment, and the long-term psychological stress of being tens or hundreds of days away from Earth. And if you tried to lay out a research plan to address those questions, you would imagine a set of missions that first went away from the Earth for a month or two, and then for many months, and then for a year, and then for several years, and it just so happens that the sequence of missions in this, uh, in this version of the flexible path have that, that property that you can go for weeks and then months and then years. So that the chart is in fact organized by the difficulty of having the human explorers survive the trip. So uh, the first really interesting mission that would captivate the interest of the public uh, the first, locate, the first thing you would go and visit is a near-Earth object. Uh, it's the, maybe the first time we leave the Earth-Moon system. Uh, it, would, uh, it would be of significant scientific value. Uh, these are the things that, that occasionally bump into the Earth and make uh, very energetic releases within the Earth's atmosphere, like the Cretaceous tertiary extinction that killed the dinosaurs. Uh, the near-Earth objects are uh, themselves uh, likely to have uh, very significant resources which would be uh, harvestable without having to take them up out of a gravity well, like you would have to do if you ex extracted lunar orbit uh, resources, uh, lunar resources, I'm sorry. Uh, and as I just mentioned, they're challenging missions for human adaptation. So I think it's likely that you would do something like the following. Uh, you'd do the test flights, you'd go to the lunar mission, you'd do the, uh, the, uh, 
missions to um, the near-Earth objects, and then you would decide where to go next. And the, the future decisions would be based on capability, and it would be based on discovery to date. And note that you move towards landing on the surface of Mars, and that in almost all the likely sequences, you would visit at some point or another uh, the, the surface of the moon. Now, I said I would come back to the issue of sequence, and here's the, the simple explanation of sequence. Uh, the simple explanation of sequence is to go to the lunar surface requires uh, four very large, expensive systems to be built. The heavy lift vehicle, which we essentially all agree we need to build some form or another, the crew capsule, the lunar lander, uh, and the lunar surface infrastructure. And in order to really do anything more than we did in Apollo, which was to go and make some short sortie missions to the surface of the moon, all of those systems basically have to be ready at about the same time, which means that the budget has to pay for them all to be ready at the same time. If you do something like the flexible path, what you essentially do is you build the first two, two of the four, the heavy lift vehicle and the uh, crew capsule, and then you start doing with it some missions that you can do with it for six, eight, ten years while you invest in the, the surface systems uh, and surface infrastructure. So what does it take to develop the technology to do this? Well, this is sort of an eye chart, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick off the principal things here. It develops, it requires bigger rockets. Uh, the nation does now not have, and certainly upon the retirement of the shuttle, shuttle will, will really not have, uh, anything with nearly the capability to sustain a, a, um, an exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, it's useful to think about how much stuff you have to launch to low Earth orbit uh, doing something that engineering professors like to talk about by non-dimensionalizing the problem. And the, the useful non-dimensionalizing thing is the space station which it took us over 10 years to launch in roughly 20 ton chunks. So how many space stations a year do we have to launch to go to the moon or go towards Mars? And it's at least several. Several space stations worth of mass to low Earth orbit. So since using the shuttle, it took us a decade to launch one of them you can see that we need something like an order of magnitude increase in capability in our launch systems to low Earth orbit. And that requires uh, uh, the development or the application of a wide range of propulsion technologies. Um, the next one on the list is figuring out how to keep the humans safe uh, from uh, the radiation environment and so forth, which I'll leave to Bonnie. Then there are things like autonomous rendezvous and docking, uh, the management of fuels in orbit, uh, and uh, life support for extended periods of time. I have to say that uh, if you compare this list with um, historical lists that NASA has produced, uh, it, it hasn't changing much. And in fact, when uh, Bonnie and I worked on the National Academy uh, review panel of the uh, space Technology Program of NASA, uh, it was, uh, th it, was uh, it contains similar items. Uh, what we really need to do is get the, the minds of Americans working on these. I would say that um, the, the one thing that really appeared to us as uh, a, new, a new way of thinking about the problem, it's certainly not a new idea, but a new way of thinking about the problem is the idea of, of refueling in space. Um, ever since uh, Tsiolkovsky and von Braun, we've sort of been bound in our thinking about rocket design to assume that when a rocket took off, it had with it all the fuel it needed to execute its mission. Uh, and uh, most of the rockets, all the rockets to my knowledge that we've ever built, work that way. But there is another alternative, and that's to do the analogy of what uh, long-range military aircraft do, which is to get part of the way along in your mission and then refuel. And the, uh, the technology of doing this is thought to be uh, within grasp, that is to say, 
reasonably well developed, but short of having been demonstrated in space. But the, the uh, capability it gives of potentially capable launch vehicles to low Earth orbit to become even more capable, should it be developed, uh, is really exciting. And it actually starts to make you under, uh, believe that those two and three times the annual mass of the space station to low Earth orbit might actually be uh, an achievable future. So um, I'll, I'm going to uh, hand it over to, to, to uh, Bonnie Dunbar now to talk about the, uh, the human uh, aspects of, of such an endeavor. But I do want to just sort of leave you with this, this parting idea that um, I think is the piece that, that rationalizes and pulls together uh, our aspirations in space, which is to move towards Mars, to make this the long-term goal, not something that we'll, we'll achieve in the next decade or two, but that, that will, will uh, allow us to chart a course for the technology development and scientific discovery of the time to come. Thank you, Ed. Well, I'm going to drill in a little bit to the human-centered side of it. And we've talked about uh, destinations and technologies and systems engineering being a requirement to enable uh, this discovery. And, and I, I think one of the points I want to make as we go through this is it's not just about having humans uh, do this. It's about the technologies we invest in that also spread across uh, many other sectors. Uh, although I'm going to be talking about humans and exploration, I also want you to think about humans as a centered system as we also go into commercial space flight. We want to mitigate the medical risks. There's a lot of overlap here uh, in medicine. Uh, we want to look at fractional gravity and hostile environments, which are also applicable to robotic spacecraft. We want to design the spacecraft to the human, those people working in anthropometrics now and, and uh, doing elegant designs and efficient designs for the human might take note of this. And we want to develop reliable closed-loop life support systems. In fact, they've just uh, launched one recently to the International Space Station. And think of those as eventually being somehow applicable to uh, stressed areas here on the Earth where you can completely recycle your water, because we want to take uh, an Earth with us. And having spent some time on the Mir space station and trained in Russia, if you were to really look at the one single system that fails the most and will prevent us from long duration space flight, it is the life support system. So we hope that by also investing in this high risk R&D, that the engineers and scientists will not only further human exploration in our solar system, but invest in critical new technologies and support the future of commercial space development, which is also piggybacked on many of the technologies that we have invested in over the last uh, 40 years. So those challenges are designing and engineering for those environments, understanding what those environments are. That's how the robotic spacecraft help us. Utilizing our current research platforms, such as the International Space Station. Again, designing those closed loop life support systems. And one thing that we haven't talked about is that we're not talking about ones and zeros coming back and forth to the Hubble Space Telescope. We're talking in many cases about laboratory research. That means having a down mass capability, which is the shuttle has allowed us to have uh, over these nearly 30 years of about 50,000 pounds up, but also 50,000 pounds back. And having been on two docking flights to the Mir space station, I can tell you that each time we came back, we came back with research uh, instruments, results, and failed hardware, which was then subject to failure analysis. Uh, I'd like to just uh, quote also a colleague of mine uh, that you may know, Stephen Squires, who's very much involved in spirit and opportunity, and is also an advocate of human spaceflight. And this was an interview that was done by space.com. So how do you think this effort affects the manned versus unmanned mission balance? And I have to tell you, as an active astronaut for quite a few years, we always looked them at them as synergistic uh, operations. And Steve required, you know, I'm a robot guy. That's what I've spent most of my career doing. But I'm actually a very strong supporter of human spaceflight. I believe that the most successful exploration is going to be carried out by humans, not just by robots. What Spirit and Opportunity have done in five and a half years on Mars, you and I could have done in a good week. 
Humans have a way to deal with surprises, to improvise, to change their plans on the spot. All you got to do is look at the latest Hubble mission to see that. So I can tell you all the five space flights I've had, three of them laboratory missions, that 99% of the experiments could not have been done by robots. We changed our mission plans in the flight. We repair, repaired what broke. And so you might want, want to ask about what about that other 1%. Well, yes, there were 1% that could have been automated. But in fact, they knew they were going with experiments that couldn't be automated. So why raise the cost of designing that experiment by an order of magnitude when it could, the crew was right there to help them out? And so we helped a lot of university researchers actually get experiments into flight because they could put it into that environment with 99 other experiments. You have to put a different thinking hat on. You have to put a microgravity or a fractional gravity hat on. Look at convection on the left-hand side and what a birthday candle looks like in 1G and what it looks like in a microgravity environment. And whether you're talking about any kind of convection or, or a rocket system, manned or unmanned, you've got to think differently in terms of the fact that processes are diffusion-driven and not convection-driven. Buoyancy is different. There's no such thing as sedimentation in low Earth orbit in particular. You can use that to your advantage if you're trying to grow crystals, but it can be a real challenge if you want to move liquid fuels from one container to another, something that we'd actually test for our aerospace companies in the mid-deck of the shuttle. One example of just laboratory research in the, both the shuttle and some of the work we were doing on Mir and now in the International Space Station uh, involved the National Institutes of Health, uh, and it was cellular biotechnology. Again, using this microgravity environment to grow clusters of cells outside the human body, but more in a three-dimensional environment. And uh, on one of my flights, breast cancer cell research was uh, the topic of interest. The investigators came from all over the United States. The National Institutes of Health was involved. It was peer-reviewed uh, research, and there was quite some, uh, some interesting uh, results out of that. We call this human-centered research actually bioastronautics. It has three elements. It's the space medicine and health care of the human beings on orbit. It's the human adaptation and the countermeasures, and then it's the habitation and environmental monitoring, the sensors, eventually growing plants to produce oxygen, you know, the cold closed-loop life support systems. Now, I've got some of these research lab tools I've called listed here that's helped us to understand this free fall or microgravity environment. The top two did not use people. Drop towers is how we started before we went to Mercury. Sounding rockets, where you got minutes of free fall. We started uh, flying the KC-135 parabolic aircraft with people back before we flew Mercury. It started out at Dayton, Ohio, at the Air Force Base. Uh, we used it to test fluid behavior, for example, uh, before we went into Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Before we went to the moon, and we were actually just orbiting the Earth, the Apollo vehicles, we were also doing research on both people and systems. Skylab, you'll see in a moment, was our first space station. Then the space shuttle took us to weeks of research uh, environments. The Russian Mir space station helped us uh, with a long duration space flight, and the International Space Station is up there for years. So when we went to the moon, you had to think about how systems would operate in an extreme hostile environment, microgravity to the moon, and then roughly a sixth of gravity on the surface. How did it impact fluid physics, fuel transfer, liquid cooling systems, heat transfer, life support systems, and even thermal protection systems? Our first space station was actually launched in 1973. We had three crews that went up to it of three men each, set the long duration record of 84 days. In order to be selected for those flights, you had to agree to be a human guinea pig. You had to agree to give blood, submit to whole body metabolic balances so we could uh, measure the energy that went in and the residue that came out. And it was out of those flights that we learned about disuse osteoporosis, or the loss of bone mass uh, in a weightless environment, uh, usually starting at about 90 days, or measurable at 90 days. The space shuttle really gave us our most universal low Earth orbit LEO platform, and it expanded our research capabilities and facilities. First launched in April of uh, 1981, uh, five vehicles were built. We've launched over 130 times. And most significantly, this vehicle not only took the mass to low Earth orbit, it brought it back. So it took Hubble up, but allowed us to do five servicing missions and bring instruments back. It took the European Space Lab, and they built two, 
back and forth with all of its research experiments. And we flew it, I think, 11, 12, 13 times. I flew it three times, so it's a great lab, and you'll see that in a moment. So again, about 50,000 pounds of cargo up, but still brought it back. It has allowed us to continue to build the International Space Station, and in fact, we'll be taking up a Russian research module before it uh, completes its uh, lifetime uh, this, uh, later this year. It supported a Canadian robotic arm that allowed us to uh, both capture the Hubble Space Telescope, assemble the space station to do spacewalks. It's carried hundreds of people into low Earth orbit, uh, crews up to eight people. My first flight in 85 was eight people up and eight people down. So it's been a tremendously versatile, capable vehicle. Now the mid-deck, most of you don't hear about, is also a laboratory. Some of you may have had experiments there. They had the very romantic name called mid-deck experiment. Uh, but we had many engineering departments, uh, including MIT, carry small experiments up in the mid-deck, trained on them, allowed them to be repaired, refocused, or repurposed. Thousands of universities, companies, and government agencies uh, utilize this lab. It's where we started protein crystal growth, a lot of our human physiology experiments in the shuttle. In 1971, I was fortunate to be on the first docking flight between the shuttle and the Russian space station Mir. It was called Phase One. We did nine docking flights to help mitigate the risk of building the current International Space Station. We left crew members up for as long as 90 plus days. In fact, I think Shannon Lucid was up for over six months. The object, again, was to continue to collect this biomedical uh, data on the effects of weightlessness on the human body. The Russian space station is no longer in Earth orbit. Like Skylab, which was deorbited in 1979, the Mir was eventually deorbited over the Pacific Ocean. The lab itself was very roomy. Some of you might have even flown experiments in it. We also flew payload specialists, or non-career astronauts, as Dr. Larry DeLucas behind me from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He was a protein crystallographer. That flight was 13 days, had material science experiments on it, fluid physics, human physiology, plant biology, and biotechnology, and was just one more step in our evolution of research in LEO, starting back with Apollo and going through Skylab and on to Shuttle and Space Lab, and then going on its way uh, to the International Space Station. So next we have this wonderful laboratory, which uh, uh, Dr. Crawley talked about, and that may become a national lab, the International Space Station. We started the first uh, uh, piece into low Earth orbit in the fall of 1998. It has Russian laboratories, the US Destiny Lab, Japanese laboratories, European, Canadian robotics, it's operating like this room, except the one variable. It's a 10 to the minus 6 G, or microgravity. We've had as many as, I think, 13 people when the shuttle's docked, and a continuous crew of six crew members. It's a football ball field wide, and if you haven't had the opportunity to go see it yet, go to the NASA website and find out when it's coming over Seattle, when there's no clouds. And it's quite a remarkable sight. My mother in eastern Washington, who sees it quite frequently, uh, pulls it up on the web. And if it's coming right over you, you can see it for about five minutes. Now, there are a lot of risk mitigation strategies that have been in place for 40 years on humans. And I'm just going to briefly talk about them. And this is an eye chart. But in any engineering strategy, and this is about humans as well, you first identify the risks, and you attempt to mitigate the risks. You also need data and real-time monitoring and sensors, and sometimes new sensors to work in that environment. There's a process for looking at all these risks, identifying them through all the different systems, analyzing, planning for them, tracking them, and then learning how to control them. So what are some of the things we do know about humans and in space, and what don't we know? Well, in the human body, we know there's some changes in the neurovestibular system, in the cardiovascular system, the immune system, the bone and muscle systems, and the behavior systems. Uh, we believe we're, we're closing in on most of the countermeasures. Uh, the loss of calcium is, has been addressed for several decades. And in fact, the University of Washington, I believe, has been part of that. We're most concerned about the radiation environment uh, and what that might entail and how to protect humans as uh, we go forward. These are all collected together by the Baylor College of Medicine, who 
which heads what's called the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, and I encourage you to go to their website, nsbri.org, which categorizes all these risks and looks at the technologies which are being funded to mitigate these risks. For example, the one on bone loss will tell you exactly which research universities have been selected for uh, in a peer-reviewed basis to study this area and who the, the lead researchers are. So we also develop standards, and those standards are being shared with the commercial community as well. We look at all our programs, from Mercury to the current program. We look at human factors. We look at the environmental standards. That's water and air quality, for example. Habitability, light, food, clothing, spacesuit designs. And we compare analogs. To them to analogs on the Earth, such as our Antarctica analogs, and we develop what are called standards. We have human system standards, medical standards, and then we have what's called the Bioastronautics Roadmap, which are a collection of risks as we go on to the Moon and Mars. We combine those with standard technology readiness levels for spacecraft design, and some of you may have seen these. Certainly, if you go out into industry, you're going to see them, TRL-1s through 9. At some point, you have to test in environment. We don't have laboratories that simulate microgravity for long periods of time. Despite the congressman who once told me we had a zero-gravity room at the Johnson Space Center, we do not. <laughs> Your laboratory is going to be the International Space Station, both inside and on exposed platforms, looking at micrometeoroid impacts, looking at ultraviolet light radiation, looking at atomic oxygen, looking at hard vacuum. So looking at the, op the uh, recommendations that I have here, we've been to the moon, and we've had Long duration space on Mir and ISS. The Russians have actually had a, a cosmonaut on Mir for a year. We've not quantified or mitigated all the risks. Human systems engineering research on the International Space Station is required to mitigate that risk. It must conduct, be conducted on the cell, animal, and human levels in 1G, microgravity, and fractional gravity, one third for Mars and one sixth for the Moon. And we need to lose all, use all the lessons learned we've acquired over time from Mercury to the, to the current programs, and we must share these with the universities and ensure that they're communicated, that they become part of your coursework. Because one of my pressing questions now is as we stop programs, and I started out as a young engineer with Rockwell, where is the corporate memory? How do we ensure that we can go on with the next program and build on the past? So I am hopeful that someday we will have lunar bases, as we do have bases in Antarctica right now. And I hope that I'm still alive when we can actually see geological work being done by humans on Mars. Thank you very much. So is Mike here? Uh, we're going to go ahead, uh, Mike will be right back, and uh, start with our panel discussion. And so I, uh, I think I'm going to open it up, and Mike will be back in a moment uh, with uh, Dr. Crawley. And that is, as you look at the engineering challenges in all of the different scenarios, and we know there are a lot of different choices out there, what would you rank as the top three that uh, we need to be focusing on now and investing in? I, I think it's unquestionably true that it's still very hard to get off the surface of the Earth and get to low Earth orbit. So the, the technologies associated with propulsion, uh, uh, cost-effective propulsion, reliable and safe propulsion, and, and heavy lift systems certainly are at the top of the list. Because if we can't find a way to sustainably and within reasonable budget expectations operate a transportation system to low Earth orbit, we won't be able to do anything else. Uh, the uh, the next basket of them, I would say, are associated with keeping humans alive. You know, that means both the life support systems, uh, the radiation protection, um, uh, and so forth. Uh, a, a very significant fraction, and, and closing some of those life support loops, a very significant fraction of what you take with you on a long-term mission in space is actually the consumables for the humans aboard. And uh, the more of those loops that you can close, closing the, the water loop and closing the carbon loop and so forth, um, the less and less you have to take along and the more uh, 
the more self-sufficient the endeavor becomes. And I guess I would have to say that the, the third basket is probably associated with things like autonomy, uh, relieving the crew of as many responsibilities for the operation, if you will, the sort of mundane operation of the vehicle in the long term so that they can actually do what humans are, are best able to do, which is to explore and think and probe. Um, many of you know that um, the International Space Station had on board a crew of about three for much of the time when it was being assembled. Now it's gone up to six, the sort of nominal full complement. Uh, and if you actually look at the expenditure of time of the crew of three, a pretty significant fraction of it was just keeping the International Space Station running. So the, the, the going from three crew to six crew was much more than doubling the scientific capability. It was more like you know, times three or four of the scientific capability of the space station as in ter measured in terms of available crew hours. So I would say those three big buckets. The question, Mike, was what are, what are sort of the main investments we need for technology? And I said getting to low Earth orbit, keeping the crew alive, and autonomy and information systems to relieve the crew of certain things so they can do what humans can do best. Uh, and, I, and I'll comment on that as well. Um, you know, the transmission time for communications in Mars is about 20 minutes each way, depending where you are in the orbit. So you're not going to have a casual conversation with a mission control. So having smart systems on board, and they've actually talked about having multidisciplinary crew members as well you know, that can, can support all that. Mike? Well, I, I think Mars is going to put us more back. It will put us into an environment more like what uh, the captains of uh, sailing ships uh, encountered in the era of maritime discovery, where a, a ship would leave home with orders of a strategic nature, and the judgment of the captain and the senior officers was uh, allowed to uh, evolve depending on the circumstances that they faced in order to accomplish the major goals. Um, you won't be, as you said, when you're anywhere for up to 20 minutes one-way delay, you, you won't be uh, micromanaging in real time what the crew does. So. We have to have very smart uh, computers with us as well uh, to help advise the crew. Where is the political will? That's the weak link in everything because what you've described is a decades-long program. And unfortunately, we're on the two, four, six year political cycle and will the political will be there from administration to administration, from Congress to Congress? That's the part that worries me. So it's worked pretty well for the last 50 years or so. But uh, what do you see as the future? What do we need to do as a general educated public to help the process along from the trenches where we work? Mike, you want to start? Okay, I'll start. Um, with all due respect to Ed, um, whom I've known for over 20 years at least, and whom we have a very good relationship, I, I could not disagree more with Flexible Path. Uh, I, I think it is difficult enough to sustain political will when you say exactly what it is that you are going to do, and exactly when you intend to do it, and fund it accordingly. And when you leave open to the political process, we might go here and we might go there and we're not sure of the order, I, I, th I think it flunks Washington 101. Um, so I don't think flexible path is sustainable. I think it is a political attempt to make it appear to have a great space program without actually having to do the hard things necessary to have a great space program. It, it, it costs money. To, it's pardon? a rational approach. Well, it's, with, got, it's got right. mile, mile posts on the with, way from with A regard, to B to C. Well, if I could finish. Yeah. With regard to the point, I, Ed and I would be, I think, completely in sync when I say you're not going to land people on Mars without first having voyaged to deep space, without first having utilized the ISS for all that it, it is worth, and without first having utilize the planetary surface that's three and a half days from home. You're going to do all those things. But 
at some point, if you want to land on Mars, you have to, uh, sorry, land on the moon, you have to actually build a lunar lander. If you want to go to an asteroid and you need to build a mission module capable of surviving for many months in space, you, you, hack, you actually have to commit to specific engineering accomplishments with milestones. And, and in the absence of that commitment, I, I don't see a real program. I'm sorry. Well, uh, I, you, Mike and I disagree about this less than might be apparent on the surface. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very concerned about the, the sort of uh, apparent and real instability that has existed in the human spaceflight program for you know, a decade or so. When, once it became apparent that there was an end to the shuttle, you know, what, what we did next. And, uh, you know, we, my, uh, my simplistic answer to your question, it's not a simplistic answer, it's a, it's sort of a heartfelt answer, is that the most important thing we need to do is develop a national consensus on what it is we're going to do and, and stick to it. <laughs> well, we had a national consensus twice voted on by the Congress with near unanimity in 2005 and 2008 um, as, as, I would say, democratic, since some of this seems to involve partisan politics, uh, subcommittee chairwoman uh, Giffords said, the, uh, I, I can't quote exactly, but she issued last August a, a very, I think, telling statement. She made the point that uh, President Obama has inherited many problems. Uh, space was not and did not need to be one of them. We had a consensus across party aisles on what to be done and, and I do not, I, I will emphatically say, I do not think the machinations of the last year have, uh, have improved the U.S. posture in space. Um. Um, so you didn't, any of you, discuss the private launch services that are apparently going to be how the United States gets humans into orbit uh, if President Obama's plan to cancel constellation goes forward um, and that the idea would be to, his, his idea is to get private enterprise to be taking over low earth orbit activities so that NASA can in fact focus on a lot of the issues that Ed very nicely played, you know, uh, poised for us. So the, I'd like to hear a little bit of discussion about do you think it's realistic that SpaceX and the other launch services will be able to uh, take over at least the non-heavy lift piece uh, and eventually humans and, and how long eventually is. Because if we do can, you know, go ahead and cancel Constellation, then that seems to be the path forward. And is that realistic? And I'm sure we'll get a, some differences of opinion, but I'd like to hear it discussed. Ed or Mike, which one? I'll start. It's not unrealistic in concept. It's extremely unrealistic in time frame. Um, and, and in fact, when you said, this is how we're going to be putting humans in space if Constellation's canceled, well, no, we're not, because it isn't actually going to work anytime soon, and it's merely a question of how long you have to wait to discover that. Um, uh, no one, I, I, I remain the only sitting government official who ever actually put any money into commercial space from a government perch, about half a billion dollars in my tenure, and I con continue to believe it's money well spent. Uh, one needs to spend that and more for a longer period of time as an incentive for commercial spaceflight to develop. No one wants to see it more than I. Uh, but to, um, there, there is a saying in rock climbing about not letting go of uh, both handholds at the same time. Uh, if we care, if we care about human spaceflight, if we regard it as a strategic asset for the United States, and I do, per Ed's comment earlier about his response to the, to the U, his folks in the UK, if we think that human spaceflight is a strategic asset for the United States, then I would remind everybody that hope is not a management strategy. Um, when and if commercial players come along who can loft cargo 
on a repeatedly successful basis to the space station, then I would say, good on you, now let's talk about crew. But uh, as of today, uh, there, there is no, quote, commercial entrepreneur who can even put cargo into space reliably. I do not include in this group um, the products of Atlas and Delta, which, are, which, which were developed you know, on, by, by prime contractors with government upfront funding. Uh, government funding in advance of delivering a product is not commercial. So uh, I'm, I find myself in the awkward position of being the strongest possible supporter of government policies to encourage the development of commercial space and yet not wanting to abandon what we have until I can touch it. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you. So I, I, I think that um, Mike should be applauded because he is, in fact, the only government, sitting government official who stimulated uh, Ever in put any, any, money into it. any significant way commercial, uh, commercial endeavors in, in, crude, in um, sorry, cargo delivery, which are underway. Uh, the, um, from a policy perspective, um, both the appropriations and authorization committees and the executive branch in both administrations have basically given NASA direction that it should use commercial delivery of crew to low Earth orbit to the maximum extent practicable, or words to that effect. So this isn't a new idea that anyone came up with recently. It, in fact, is, is well ensconced in, in the policy of, of the government. Uh, I actually agree with Mike that uh, the ideal thing to do would be to decide two, three, four, five years from now uh, if uh, the right thing to do is to entrust uh, human crew delivery to low Earth orbit. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mike would also agree that you, you have to make decisions when, you, when the, it's time for the decision to be made. And we were asked on the Augustine Committee essentially to look at the, the relative merits of, of this uh, now. And we said, it has some merit. Uh, if a properly constructed acquisition process that made use of the flexibility that's given to NASA in the Space Act and was open to both the, call them entrepreneurial companies like SpaceX and the established companies like ULA and Boeing and Lockheed, uh, uh, those companies all said to us that they would be interested under the right acquisition strategy in pursu pursuing a commercial crew delivery service. Uh, or five out of the, the six or seven of them said that. Uh, however, if you read the Augustine report carefully, it basically says, but this is still a pretty risky proposition uh, at this time, and therefore, uh, if the government pursues such a strategy, it should make sure that there is some backup or fallback uh, that it can pursue if it, if it fails to materialize. Uh, and then we listed a, several of the fallbacks or alternatives. Uh, and and it, I, I want to be really clear, I do not believe that the, uh, the risk in this venture is technical. Uh, the American aerospace companies have built every human space launch system that NASA has ever used. NASA does not build systems, NASA acquires systems, by and large, in its, in its human space life. Uh, the, the, the delivery of, of crew to low Earth orbit uh, is sort of a, beef, a task for a beefed up Gemini capsule, a three or four person capsule of the complexity of Gemini, which American aerospace industry uh, made uh, over 40 years ago. Uh, the risk is business risk. Whether NASA will actually uh, find a way to structure an acquisition that will give reasonable assurances to commercial providers to put money at risk, and whether NASA will have the will to follow through on that strategy with uh, the appropriate level of safety supervision uh, and, and uh, flight qualification and not the detailed management of the program. Uh, th that's, I think, where the risks are. Um, we, in fact, are entrusting uh, human spaceflight over the next five years, despite every effort that Mike made to the contrary when he was the administrator, to commercial providers. They happen to be in Russia. 
So we actually are using commercial providers of, of, of uh, crew launch who happen to uh, uh, operate in a different com country. Russian crew launch systems were designed by Russian government engineers and are the same ones that we have today. And, and I, I have to say, I think, uh, I, I think the comments about which are often in the media that, that American aerospace companies provide every system that, that has ever put anything into space are literally true, but utterly miss the point of the interaction between government engineers and industry engineers in, in fielding a system. Uh, you know. Well, but, but that, that's true, Mike, but it's also true that um, the technology necessary to do this no longer, in the view of the companies that do it, no longer need that, that, uh, that interaction. They need the responsible role of, of NASA or whoever the government puts in charge of essentially uh, certifying the system so that it's demonstrably safe and, 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 and so forth. And, and as I say, when I see people who put, when I see people put cargo into space unassisted and unsupervised by the government with a new system, then I will now be ready to have the discussion about putting people into space. And, 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 and so I think we are embarked on a policy debacle. Uh, and I, because I have good genetics, expect to see that debacle unfold. Uh, and then we will recover as best we can. Uh, but when I see people put cargo into space unsupervised, then I will, I will have the discussion about crew. And the point about having low Earth orbit crew systems that are evolved Geminis is absolutely on target. The point is it's not about the capsule, it's about the rocket. The rocket's the hard part. Mm -hmm. The rocket's the hard part. It's not what the crew sits in. That's relatively easy. Um, in a well-ordered world, the U.S. government would have policies whereby we understood that we needed one kind of crew vehicle for beyond low Earth orbit and another kind of crew system for Earth orbit. Uh, the regrettable fact is that at no time in our 50-year history of spaceflight has the U.S. Congress chosen to authorize uh, the development of more than one system at a time. So we have to make, we have to make do with one. And uh, the, the ability to specialize we don't have the equivalent of airplanes. We don't have the space equivalent of airplanes specialized for different tasks, regrettably. And I think that will be the challenge of the future because we do have to get it right for humans uh, on, on board. And uh, I know that that knowledge base doesn't reside in any single university and a few companies. And we'll need to make sure we capture the government side as well as the, the contractor side to make sure that we do it right the next time. It's not a matter of the badge people are wearing, it's a matter of the incentives in play. And the, the knowledge, if, the corporate knowledge. If, if I'm working to make a profit for my company, I'm going to make different choices than if I'm working in the public interest. It, it, is, in, it is inescapable that people make different choices depending on the incentive systems in play. And, and if I'm a contractor and invited to come and talk to the Augustine Commission, I'm going to say whatever the hell I think I need to say in order to get a more favorable distribution of money to my company. Well, I think that that's going to be one of our challenges going forward. I've been given the one-minute mark, and I know that uh, Dr. Crawley and Dr. Griffin will be around uh, afterwards, and I want to thank both of them for being here. We've got some, I think, important decisions for the nation and some important technical challenges if we're going to continue to be a nation exploring in space. So thank you very much.